as, as usual, so my name is Martin Sloan. Um, I'm a partner in the Commercial Services Data Protection Team at Brodie's, and as usual, I'll be joined by Grant Campbell. And we've also got uh, with us today Rachel Lawson, who's a senior solicitor in, in the Data Protection Team here at Brodie's, and will be familiar to many of you on, on the call. Um, if you'd registered this some time ago, you may remember we were due to do this session uh, at the end of May, but we decided to reschedule it in the hope that we would have um, a bit more information on the government's plans for data reform, um, which at that point uh, were um, trailed as going to be in the Queen's speech. Um, and we also hope that we'd have the Information Commission's finalised guidance on international transfers. We've got one of the two of those, so I think that's not a bad hit rate. Um, we've got plenty to talk about in terms of data reform, um, and Grant will tell you where we are on, on international transfers. So just a quick overview um, for, for this section session. Uh, so Grant will kick off talking about international transfers, um, looking at what's going on both here in the UK and within the EU. I'll then be talking about the government's response to its data reform consultation, which was published last Friday, um, and we've been working through over the last few days. And then Rachel's going to do a roundup of some of the recent regulatory enforcement action um, and the key messages we can take from that. And also an overview of some recent cases that have been in the course and other new laws and uh, guidance that are coming down the, down the track and things that you may have missed. And then we will finish up, I'm sure we'll have lots of questions today, and we'll finish up with some time for questions um, at the end. So uh, on that, I'll hand over to Grant, who will um, kick us off with international transfers. Thank you, Martin. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. As Martin said, we had hoped uh, by uh, postponing the earlier session that we would have had the ICO's guidance on international data transfers, but that has yet to be published. So today, what I'm going to do is really just give an overview of the developments of the last six months. But we did promise when we did the session at the back end of last year that we would dedicate a special session international transfers once the ICO's guidance had been issued and we intend to keep to that so um, although we're not going to go into great depth on this topic today uh, we do promise that we will do as and when we've got the ICO's guidance so that will come please look out for that so just moving on uh, those of you who uh, joined in the last session will recall that I spent quite a lot of time uh, going through the ICO's uh, consultation package from August 21. Um, so the ICO consulted on a draft international data transfer agreement, the draft UK addendum to wrap around the EU standard contractual clauses, and it also uh, produced a draft uh, transfer risk assessment uh, tool and consulted on various questions related to international transfers and the idea was then that it would, it would issue uh, updated guidance. The ICO at the time promised a system that would be proportionate and risk-based. So we had expected that um, we would have got the IDTA, the addendum and the guidance uh, well before now. We did get the final form of IDTA, so the International Data Transfer Agreement and the addendum. They were laid before Parliament in February and they were approved and they came into force on the 21st of March this year. The ICO has said that it plans to issue clause by clause guidance on the IDTA IDTA and addendum, guidance on the transfer risk assessment and how to use the IDTA, and further clarifications on its transfer guidance, particularly on the questions that were the subject of the August consultation. Move on. Uh, unfortunately, those things have not been published. Um, the ICO has said they will be published soon, but they have not yet appeared. So that leaves us with a number of areas of uncertainty. So we have the IDTA, so we know what it says, but we don't have finalized guidance as to what the TRA process looks like. So what does the transfer risk assessment process look like? And in many ways, that is the secret sauce to the use of the IDTA. And we're still also um, slightly up in the air on some of the interesting issues that the ICO went out to con cons consult on back in August, particularly around when there may or may not be considered to be a restricted transfer and some of the questions that were being asked pointed to potential divergence from the EU approach. So we don't yet know where the ICO stands on the issues that it consulted on um, uh, in August. Um, now the guidance has been much delayed, we suspect possibly to factor in the UK government's data protection reform proposals, 
which Martin's going to talk about immediately after me. Uh, but we haven't had an explanation. So all we're promised is they are coming soon, but soon is, you know, we're now three or four months after the IDTA has been published and we're still without guidance. Uh, our view is if you're using the IDTA or the addendum, look at the transfer risk assessment process that was set out in the draft guidance. We don't think you can be, we don't think that you can be criticized for using the draft guidance perhaps be a little cautious in terms of the risk assessment elements, uh, but keep an eye out for the for the finalised guidance when it comes. The spade work that you do going through the transfer risk assessment process now will not be wasted. We don't expect that the TRA is going to be completely different to the one that the ICO went out to consult on back in August. So what should organisations be doing now? Well, carrying out transfer risk assessments for all existing and new international transfers. I think in terms of uh, contracts to put in place, the old Brexit uh, varied EU SECs continue to be valid uh, if they're entered into prior to the 21st of September, um, and they will be valid until the 21st of March. But using them doesn't get you out of having to go through the transfer risk assessment process. Otherwise, for international transfers from the UK, then you would be using the IDTA or, or the addendum if you're also using the new form EU SCCs. So, um, and remember that the new EU SCCs are not valid under the UK regime unless they are uh, wrapped with the new addendum. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so what we thought we'd do is having a, briefly gone over where we are with the UK position, was to look a little further afield. So interesting um, divergence, I think, or certainly pointed to divergence in approach with the UK. Um, the, at, at the end of last year, the Austrian uh, Data Protection Authority ruled the, the use of Google Analytics by an Austrian website operator contravened EU GDPR. And the thinking was, and we covered again this in the session in December, uh, Google um, uh, is uh, subject to FISA 702 as an electronic communication service provider, and therefore it is subject to uh, surveillance by US agencies. Uh, the data that was being collected by uh, Google Analytics, Google went to great lengths to explain all of the things that it did to, to minimize the risk of uh, surveillance by uh, US intelligence agencies. Uh, it talked about the fact that the data was encrypted at rest and there were various different measures that were in place that were all intended to protect the data, but Google could still identify individuals from the data and the organizational and contractual measures that were put in place were held by the Austrian Data Protection Authority to be insufficient. And I think what was particularly significant was the Austrian DPA rejected a risk-based approach. So the approach of saying, look, actually, we don't get requested for this information. Yes, we are subject to FISA, but we don't get requests for this sort of information, didn't wash. And that seems to us to run contrary, certainly to the guidance that the ICO issued in draft back in August, where it suggested that its approach was going to be proportionate and risk-based. So again, it points to perhaps a divergence in regulatory approach to when um, SECs or the UK IDTA work. The guidance, if you go to it, is it's expressly stated to be guidance. It's for general information purposes. And the commission say, look, actually, ultimately, decisions on this stuff is for the regulators and the courts, not for us. But they do publish about 30 uh, Q and A's on practical issues that they see arising in relation to the use of the SECs. They say these Q and A's, the Q and A will be dynamic. They will add more uh, answers to questions as they come up. Worthwhile looking at. My only observation, I think, would be that the answer questions that are fairly straightforward to answer, what or they answer them in terms where the examples are clear cut. They don't really go into issues where the answers may be more nuanced. One thing that is worth mentioning in passing is that there is a recognition that the EU SECs can't be used with the data importer abroad is itself directly subject to GDPR. 
and the Commission acknowledges that and says that they are actually working on a yet further set of standard contractual clauses that will work where the importer is itself subject to UK GDPR. So more to come. Next, please. I suppose the the you, you may all be holding your head in your hands and thinking this is getting horrendously complicated. Uh, I think the one bright spot um, for particularly for transfers around the US is that there was an announcement in March. It's just a single page um, glossy flyer from the US administration and the EU Commission suggesting that they have been working on a, what well, you could call it a safe harbor three or a privacy shield two to allow the free flow of data to participate in US companies, again, under the auspices of the US Federal Trade Commission. Um, the agreement is in principle, they say that it actually needs to be written down in legally binding form, and I think they're all working on that. But I think what we are hoping is that actually something will come out of this that will enable uh, companies that sign up to these rules in the US to receive data without necessarily having to go through the pain of going through all these, these um, different forms of contractual mechanism. I think the other thing that I would say just and, and by way of trend, I think it's important to just to, to bear in mind the wider context. There is a broader proliferation of EU style laws around the world. I've listed two there, one China, the other one in the UAE. And I think they're relevant, I think, because we always think about international transfers in the context of can we transfer data to another, uh, to another third country, but actually, what this is pointing to is that these countries are going to have their own data protection laws and the issue of whether data can be transferred to the EU and the UK arises because you need to make sure that you are compliant with their rules on international transfer. So this reverse transfer issue is not just one way. As more and more data protection laws are promulgated around the world, the issue of compliance is one not just of divergence, but it's also one of proliferation. And finally, just the last thing I would say is you may have noticed that in the US, uh, there is now a proposal, and this is a bipartisan initiative. So uh, congressmen from both sides are, are introducing a federal privacy bill into Congress. It would be the American Data Privacy and Protection Act. Um, whether or not it passes is unclear. I think time before the midterm elections is quite short. Um, but the fact that there is now a serious attempt to actually introduce a federal data privacy law in the states, I think is quite significant. And I think it's in part fueled by the desire to see a privacy law in the states that can then underpin wider cybersecurity and other initiatives. And that's in part uh, raised by wider international events, Russia and the Ukraine, etc. So there's a lot to happen. As I say, we will do a separate session on international transfers when we have uh, the ICO's guidance, so please look out for that. And I think following that, I'll hand over to Martin, who's going to talk about data protection reform. Martin. Thanks, Grant. Uh, yes, I'm going to spend the next 10 minutes or so talking about what is going on with data reform. Um, for those of you that were with us uh, last November, December time for our last update, you remember that the consultation had taken place um, and closed and the government was looking at the responses to that. Um, so this is all about how the UK government can use the I suppose the freedom um, that it now has following Brexit to deviate or move away from uh, GDPR and the Privacy Directive in terms of the law that applies in the UK. So uh, the government um, trailed, uh, there's going to be legislating on this in the Queen's Speech announcement um, at the, uh, the end of May. Um, and then last Friday, we had the publication of the um, consultation response. Interesting, I think, that it was published on a Friday. And also interesting that it didn't have the same level of media coverage that the consultation itself had last year, and um, which I think is perhaps reflective of the fact that uh, some of the, report, the reforms being taken forward are not quite as bold um, as some of the things that were being proposed last year. So, I mean, on, on that note, it is fairly clear, having read through the consultation response, um, that a lot of the proposed reforms had fairly mixed views from respondents. There are quite a number a number of areas where the government is proposing to legislate even though respondents had dis the majority of respondents had disagreed with a particular proposal and i'll talk a bit about that but a lot of the feedback was saying you know um we don't want anything to happen that will impact on the eu adequacy decision uh things that are going to cost to implement we're not interested in that 
and also this general if it isn't broken then then why fix it what you know particularly when looking at the accountability framework there are also concerns about the impact on the rights of data subjects as well um, and I say that that has led to some stuff being taken forward, even though uh, respondents didn't agree with that, but some of the more contentious proposals have been dropped. Okay, so what is actually going to be changing then? Well, first up, and the one that we'll spend a bit more time on uh, in one of the later slides around accountability framework, that is being uh, shaken up. So I'll talk a bit about what is happening on that and the impact of it um, and what that means for DPOs and others um, at the moment. On international transfers, so following on what Grant has said, um, the, the bill will amend the law to make um, an express reference to risk-based approach when um, assessing adequacy. So when the UK government is making an assessment of adequacy for another country, it will now be able to expressly take into account the risk of that. I, I don't know quite how that works in practice because ultimately risk needs to be assessed knowing what data has been transferred and the identity of the recipient. So I'm not sure how you would assess risk at a a national level, but we'll, we'll see the detail of that. Um, the Secretary of State is also going to have a bit of flexibility when it comes to making adequacy decisions, including taking into account whether the transfer is, quotes, desirable. Um, that appears to provide quite a bit of leeway to um, effectively put to one side perhaps some of the risks identified and then look at whether for trade or, or other purposes, a deal, uh, you know, the, the government wishes to do a deal. And in relation to the IDTA and other transfer mechanisms, as Grant has said, you know, the, the ICO's approach in its draft guidance very clearly places a lot of emphasis on assessing risk. That will be um, now recognised in law um, through the amendments in, in the bill. So the, uh, the law will expressly talk about in Article 46, emphasising proportionality and, and assessing the risk of the, the transfer that you're actually making, which is, is helpful in terms of giving a statutory basis for the approach that the ICO has taken. Um, on legitimate interest, so the white paper, the, the consultation paper had proposed white listing a number of um, activities um, where organisations wouldn't need to actually do a legitimate in interest assessment. There was quite a bit of pushback on this um, and the government is proceeding with including a white list, but it will be much more limited than I think had originally been envisaged. So it will mainly focus on activities that are for the prevention of crime or safeguarding or matters that are in the public interest. And we need to see the detail on that to see what actually makes on the list, but it's not quite as broad as it has been before. Um, there was concern that that, that would undermine the, 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 the operation of the legitimate interest condition. On artificial intelligence, so not, not as much happening on this as was proposed last September. Um, the main thing to flag is that there will be a new clear legal basis for using special category data, where you're using that for the purpose of bias monitoring and correction, so using data to actually ensure that your AI is making the right decisions and it's not um, perpetuating inherent bias um, and you can correct errors in that. So that I think is, is a helpful addition. I'll talk a bit about some of the other stuff in AI um, on the next slide. On research, um, the, the main changes here are clarifying the law and simplifying it, um, which is good. And there'll be a new definition of scientific research, which brings forward some of the provisions that are in the, the um, recitals of GDPR into the main body, into the operative provisions. Um, so again, that would be welcome for organisations who are involved in, in research activities. <clears throat> On data subject requests, um, there'll be some changes to align some, some of the exceptions with FOI law around vexatious or excessive requests. There are, will also, I think, be other changes made, but we don't know the detail yet, to reduce some of the burden on SMEs in some particular sectors and handling DSARs. It's not quite clear what that means. Clearly, that's a bit of a Trojan horse. It could be quite broad or it could be quite narrow. And we'll need to wait and see what happens in that. On complaints, so organisations will have to be in place a transparent complaints process. Um, and that will need to be used by individuals before they then complain to the ICO. So that is good to cut down some of the ICO complaints. On public tasks, the um, organisations who are performing a function for a public authority will be able to now borrow the public authority's public task condition. So if, for example, your organisation is being asked to share data with a public authority for a public task, then the moment you can't borrow um, the public authority's public task condition, but the amendments will, will enable that to happen. So that will that will help with things like data sharing, but I don't think that will extend to um, sharing special category data. We'll, we need to see the detail on that. On special category data, we'll get some more um, legal basis in Schedule 1 based on substantial public interest to fill in some gaps. 
and then the other changes around aligning parts D and 4, which deal with law enforcement and intelligence service processing to align the terminology with UK GDPR. Now, that was implemented under directive, so I'm not quite sure why that wasn't done when the bill was drafted, when the DPA 2018 was being passed. But for those of you involved in law enforcement, that, that will be a helpful clarification. On e-privacy, there's been a lot of talk about what's happening with cookies. Um, cutting through it, actually, the, there's not a huge amount happening just now. So the government is very clear that it wants to move to opt-out um, for dealing with cookie consent, but that's not going to happen until there's a browser-based solution in place that enables people to actually properly manage cookies. And that is something which is the, the e-privacy regulation that is stuck within the, the EU institutions um, is, is going to legislate for. But in the meantime, um, the requirement for consent for using non-intrusive cookies will be will be removed. Um, that will include uh, website analytics. Um, it may also include some other stuff as well, but we'll need to wait and see the bill before we know exactly what is within that. On electronic marketing, if you are a charity um, or another non-commercial organization, you will be able to benefit from soft opt-in. I know that will be welcomed by lots of um, charities and others who, who find that um, current uh, exam situation a bit a bit weird um, so that that is good for them that they will be able to treat that in the same way as say a commercial organization it also probably means you're going to get a lot more spam from your uh, mp or counselor if you start dealing with them so pros and cons on on that and then on peck enforcement the fines will be aligned with uh, gdpr there's a bit happening with the ico as well so it will become a body corporate like other regulators rather than all the powers just being vested in individual it will get some new um, objectives that are statutory, but we are told that won't cut across its independence. Um, it will be required to set up expert panels when it's developing codes of practice and guidance, which I think will help with making them better, better suited to the, the audience they're being prepared for. Um, so I think that that is a good thing. But on the other hand, the Secretary of State will now have the power to approve codes and guidance before they're laid before Parliament, so effectively a right of veto, um, which uh, uh, perhaps interferes with the independence. Um, I mentioned complaints before um, around the complaints process and the ISO will now be able to set a criteria for deciding when it doesn't want to investigate a complaint. Um, and it may also get a new name as well, but we don't know what that will be. Okay, so what's not been taken forward? Um, Article 22, this is your right to review of our um, automated decision. That is not being taken forward. That was pretty contentious. On AI, there, there will be some new developments in terms of the role of fairness and explainability, but that will be taken up, taken forward under a separate AI work stream rather than as part of data protection reform. Um, the proposal to reintroduce the data protection fee is not being taken forward. Um, there was strong opposition to that. Um, and on international transfers, there have been some talk, and Grant uh, alluded to this in his, his presentation, around removing uh, the rules from reverse transfers, so sending data back from where it came, say you're a UK processor, returning data to a non-UK controller, that is not, not happening. So that will remain within scope. And then on research, they're, they're not going to go ahead with creating a specific legal basis for research under Article 6, because the conclusion is that is not, not necessary. Okay, so I mentioned there's a new accountability framework, and I think this will be probably the thing that will be most interest people that are with us today. Here's the headlines. So the requirement of a DPO, if you have to have one at the moment, will be abolished. Um, there will no longer be a need to maintain an Article 30 register in its current form, and there will no longer be an obligation to carry out DPIAs in relation to high-risk processing. And what we're going to have in place is something called privacy management programs. And the idea behind all of this is that we're much less prescriptive and give organisations a bit more flexibility as to how they design their, their compliance framework based on assessing risk, looking at the type of data they process and the volume of data that they process. So we've got a bit of detail around what, what the elements of that will be. Um, there will be a leadership and oversight element, including a requirement to appoint a senior responsible individual um, who will have oversight for compliance and, and dealing with the information commissioner and data subjects and ensuring that training policies are in place. Sounds a bit like a DPO, but it doesn't have, it doesn't appear to have um, the same obligations around being um, immune from conflicts of interest and the uh, requirements in terms of skills and expertise. So it sounds more like a sort of board level representative who takes responsibility. And that feels like a good thing, um, but um, obviously the, there's an impact there in terms of who actually does, does the work. And I suspect many organizations will continue to have someone who's a bit like a DPO doing, doing what they do at the moment. Um, on risk assessment will be part of the privacy management program. 
Um, again, we don't have detail on that, but I suspect in practice that means everyone's going to carry on using DPIAs. Um, policies and training, um, again, that sounds like what we do at the moment. Transparency, sounds like what we do at the moment. Training and awareness of staff, sounds like what we do at the moment. So looking at a lot of the themes, it seems fairly similar to what I think we all have put in place post GDPR. So it's, it is a bit unclear beyond the express removals of those three things at the top of the slide and the requirement to have a senior responsible individual, what this will mean in practice for for many organisations. I, I don't know how much actually we're going to change what we do. So what does this mean for you? Well, it, I suppose the first question lots of people are asking is around, will this impact on EU adequacy? I, I think the changes that are being taken forward would be described as evolutionary, they are not revolutionary. And I don't think there's much in here that is going to lead to the EU deciding that actually the UK no longer has essential equivalence. It may not be the same as GDPR, but I don't think it is you know, materially different to other countries where there's an adequacy finding. So I don't think that is an impact. The only thing where there is a potential issue might be around international transfers um, and the fact that uh, you know, the, the, the rules there are being softened and then potential onward transfer of EU data might give some cause for concern. And that was something that was raised when the EU was making its adequacy decision. The other thing, of course, is the, the Bill of Rights that was published yesterday that we're, we're also working through in terms of the impact on um, the ECHR. What's the practical impact? Well, clarification and simplification, I think we, we all welcome. That, that is good. Um, there's an extension of the soft opt-in. That is good for charities and other non-commercial organisations. There may be some um, helpful developments on handling DSARS. To simplify that, we need to see the detail on it. But I think when you look at accountability and the accountability framework, you know, I, I, my, my gut feel is that most organisations are not going to rip up their, their, uh, their frameworks. Um, because they spend a lot of time and money putting those in place and there's no obvious benefit it seems to replacing that if you're a multinational then you're going to want consistency across your different entities and um, so having something different in the uk doesn't necessarily give you a benefit and if you're an sme you know it, how, how do you know what is a risk-based approach for your organization um there's going to be some very good guidance coming from the ico to help organizations on that otherwise it's actually going to cost smes more in terms of seeking um, advice on what their compliance framework should look like. So I, I thought before I hand over to, to Rachel for the next bit, we'd do a very quick poll just to get a snapshot of what um, uh, people think around um, this and whether just a, a quick answer as to whether you think that based on what you've heard, you will be revamping your compliance framework. We are really interested to hear um, what people are saying on that. I'm not sure if that is on screen yet or not, but it looks like uh, 46% of people, their initial response is that they don't think they're going to make any changes. 13% say that they will. Um, and 41%, so a pretty high number here, are unsure. And I think that's probably, you know, we're going to need to see the detail in the bill and actually work out what, what it is people are going to, going to do on this. So thanks for finding that feedback. So we'll do another, another poll during the Q&A, just get a bit more detail on some of the other questions. Really appreciate it if you could take the time to fill that in. Um, we're awaiting the bill. I think it will be the end of the, the summer before we see that, um, but we will, of course, keep you keep you posted. And on that, I will hand over to Rachel, who will do a roundup of um, the enforcement action and another relevant points you want to cover. Thanks, Martin. Um, so we are going to have a look at some recent enforcement action um, in the UK and in the EU. Um, can we move on to the next slide? Thank you. So looking at the UK, first of all, um, the ICO has fined clear, Clearview AI for various breaches of GDPR and UK GDPR. Um, essentially, what Clearview did was collect more than 20 billion images of people's faces and data from publicly available information on the internet and social media to create an online database. Um, the ICO found that people were not informed that their images were being collected or used for facial recognition uh, for clear, by Clearview's customers, including the police, and they'd also not identified an appropriate legal basis for processing. Essentially, the service that we offer customers was to allow them to upload someone's photo into their system and then they could check it for a match in the database. Um, and as well as being subject to a fine, the ICO also issued an enforcement notice ordering the company to stop obtaining and using the data um, of UK residents um, and to delete that from its system. So not just a fine there, but also some remedial action that it required them to take too. Um, Smith and others against TalkTalk Talk was um, around a group of claimants who were customers or prospective customers of TalkTalk Talk and alleged that their personal data was obtained from TalkTalk's IT systems 
by unknown criminal third parties and then used for, criminal, for fraudulent purposes. Um, the main complaint, however, was not that TalkTalk Talk itself had misused. Um, oh, can everyone see me and hear me okay? Yeah, I can. I yes, can yes, yep. I can hear you and see you. Okay, perfect. Sorry, I'll carry on. Um, so the main complaint was not that TalkTalk Talk itself had misused their information, but that it had allowed, allowed others um, to do so. Um, so there's a reference there to the Warren case that Martin spoke about last time, which was the Dixon's car phone case, where the court said that you couldn't bring a claim under the misuse of private information or breach of confidence grounds after a cyber attack, because the grounds of misuse of information require some form of positive action, and so neither of those things impose a security duty. Um, the main point under Warren was the fact that you are, so if you are subject to a third party attack, um, there's no basis for a claim under either of those torts. So here the court actually followed Warren um, and the claimant's case on this point failed because it expressly alleged a breach of a security duty as the basis for the misuse of private information. Um, but the court confirmed that for a misuse of private information to be viable, um, there had to be some sort of positive conduct on the part of the defendant. Um, Moving on to pecker fines, there's always usually a couple of these to cover. So here we have five organisations fined a total of just over £400,000 in, in relation to calls to sell insurance products um, relating to household appliances such as televisions, washing machines, fridges. Um, however, the recipients of those calls were actually registered with the Telephone Preference Service um, and the ICO also found that the businesses responsible had been deliberately targeting older people by buying marketing lists from third parties and specifically asking for information about people who were aged 16 over. So as well as following farewell of the PECR rules, um, the Information Commissioner John Edwards actually also commented on this saying, um, it's important that we recognise the distress and anxiety caused by unlawful predatory marketing calls um, and this is unacceptable so other organisations um, engaging in such action can expect tough action from the ICO. Um, Tucker Solicitors is an interesting case. Um, it's a firm of solicitors in London who experienced a ransomware attack on its systems. Essentially, the ICO determined that it had failed to implement appropriate security measures um, and it fined Tucker's £98,000. Um, I think the main takeaway from that case there is the importance of not only implementing appropriate security measures, but ensuring that you keep them reviewed um, and patch vulnerabilities and breaches on an ongoing basis. Um, the solicitors obviously had some security measures installed, but the, uh, the ICO didn't find them to be um, adequate or appropriate. Um, Read Online, this is um, about Read Online, which is an online recruitment um, company that you might be aware of, an online job seeker site. And it essentially had sent a direct marketing email to every job seeker on their database, which is around 18 million people. Um, however, that included 6 million subscribers who had actually opted out. Um, now, Reid um, said that this happened because the email was moved over to a new CRM system um, as part of a migration process for all of their emails. Um, this email status was then accidentally amended as a result of human error, meaning that the email was sent to opted out individuals. So essentially they had um, someone individually had changed the um, the status of the email from a service email to um, a marketing email. Um, and so I think the main takeaways there um, is around the ICO when it persuaded that the lack of intent by Reed. So they said, you know, it, it was it was an honest mistake, but that doesn't mean that they can take no liability. Um, and also I think some other organizations have sometime, sometimes also suffered similar um, incidents where you know you move system and things aren't copied over properly so I think one of the other main takeaways here is the importance of you know staff training and engagement on data protection matters especially in the marketing sphere um, and then quickly just covering three um, cases and enforcement action from the EU so the first case is about the Austrian post service and the advocate general 
um, at the European Court of Justice has said that the requirement in Article 15.1c, um, which states that you can tell data subjects about the recipients or categories of recipients um, to whom personal data is disclosed, is actually a choice for the data subject and not the controller. So whilst you may choose in a privacy notice or in response to a DSAR um, to just give categories of recipients, if an individual is you know, challenges that and asks asks for a specific list, um, then, then you would need to comply with that. Um, DPG Media um, is a magazine case, a magazine provider um, in the Netherlands where um, it was found by the Dutch regulator because a number of people made subject access requests and um, DPG decided to verify identities by asking people to submit um, identity documents um, and the regulator decided that they were, there was too much information in these identity documents um, which was not personal data and then not necessary for DPG um, so they have now since moved to a different verification method. So I know that sometimes some of you um, undertake verification of identity um, when you're doing data subject access requests so this is maybe something to think about if there's another way of verifying um, identities. Um, and the last um, French case is actually really interesting because we've not seen a huge amount of enforcement action against processors yet, but this is essentially um, a company which sells software solutions for medical analysis lab laboratories. So it's a processor um, and the French regulator um, fined it 1.5 million euros um, for, um, among other things, not having a written contract in place with its controllers as required by Article 28. So I think that's um, really interesting in terms of recognising that, you know, these things are not just the responsibility of controllers, but, you know, any party that's involved with data processing. Um, can move on, please? Um, again, thank you. Um, and so just to finish up, um, here are some other things that have been happening and things to look out for um, on the horizon. So we have a new information commissioner, John Edwards, took over from Elizabeth Denham. Um, the ICO has signed an income retention agreement, meaning that um, its income from fines, et cetera, don't, no, uh, or, or not all of it um, now goes to the Central Consolidated Fund and they are able to keep some um, money that it finds at organisations. So it'll be interesting to see if that impacts on the rate and scale of any ICO enforcement action going forward. Um, the DCMS published um, Cyber Security Breaches Survey um, with some quite stark um, results. 39% of UK businesses suffered a, identified a cyber attack um, and the most common um, threat vector being phishing attempts. Um, and also one particularly interesting statistic was that 31% of businesses and 26% of charities estimated that they were attacked at least once a week, um, which I think really shows the, the proliferation of cybersecurity issues there. Um, on the EU side, we have new guidelines on the right of access and data breach notifications. There is also a proposal to expand the NIS regulations to managed service providers. Um, I think this is a particular point that might be of interest to charities and SMEs, um, particularly organisations if you outsource your IT services. Um, what this will do is put these obligations on essentially um, cyber security and other reporting of requirements um, on your managed outsourced provider which would then remove the obligation from you know the charity or the SME where you might not have that expertise so I think that's probably quite a positive um, development and lastly um, in the Queen's speech an announcement was made of a product security and telecommunications infrastructure bill and um, essentially this would bring in stricter rules around connected devices so for example in your home like smart TVs, security cameras and alarm systems um, and including putting responsibilities on providers, even at the installation stage. So not just the manufacturers, but also the distributors, um, which could have implications, um, quite wide reaching implications um, on that whole income chain there. So that's all from me. Thanks, Rachel. So just before we hand, um, hand back to Grant, um, who will um, chair, chair the Q&A, um, as you mentioned, we'll be doing a special session on international transfers as soon as we get 
the finalised guidance. We, we can't give you any dates on that. We'd love to. We'd love to have done it before now, but we are at the mercy of the ISO as to when they decide to press go and that, that guidance, but we will, we will do that session. Thank you. Uh, so just do a couple of questions that have, have come up on the chat bar. Um, so the first one on international transfers about dates. I'm quite uh, pleased to be able to set this uh, set this right. It is a bit confusing. So there's a question about um, when the old style SECs uh, can be used for. There was a bit of confusion. So we have to think about this both in the context of the UK regime and also the EU regime. So the 27th of December 22 is actually an EU deadline. So that's when you need to stop using the old um, EU SECs. In the UK, and there's a little bit further confusion because under the transitional arrangements, I think the ICO originally made a mistake in terms of suggesting that the cutoff date would be September 2021. It is actually September 2022. So the date that I put in the slides, I think, is, is the correct one. So it's again, it's because we've got parallel regimes and we're both using these EU old style SECs and there's different dates depending on the context in which you use them. So that 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 was that one. Uh, the other questions are more around uh, data reform. And um, I guess uh, probably for Martin, and I think we kind of know the answer from this from, from the comments that he has given already. Uh, but I think one of the questions is, you know, under Brexit, we were expecting that one of the benefits would be substantial reform of data protection. Um, is uh, this sounds a bit more like tinkering around the edges? What do you have to say, Martin? Yeah, I think I would. Yeah, I, I would agree with with that. I mean, as I said, I think this is evolutionary rather than revolutionary, and I think that it recognises the reality that if you do anything too radical, then you um, impact on that EU adequacy decision, which um, is something that the government just doesn't, I don't think, want to go near. Um, you know, th there is headline grabbing stuff around the removal of cookie banners. Um, but even that, it looks like it was somewhere down the track because there would need to be a browser based edition in place that actually works. So I think it is very much evolutionary rather than revolutionary. I had wondered whether, you know, one of the things that the government could have done um, would be to consolidate UK GDPR and the Data Protection Act 2018 into a single text. I think we might all have appreciated that, um, having one document to work for, work from, but even that in, in the response, consultation response um, was said to be a step too far for just now, you know, so um, that may come further down the line, but in the meantime, we are stuck with juggling a number of different documents and recitals and operative provisions. Um, so we've, even that sort of reform is, is not something that's been done, done at the moment. Another question, is there any suggestion that the public sector will be able to use legitimate interests? as a legal basis for processing? No, so I mean, they, we have the rules at the moment that allow legitimate interest to be relied upon by some public authorities in certain circumstances. So particularly if you're a, a hybrid organisation like a university and you're carrying out commercial activities, you can rely upon it. But no, we still have um, the public task condition. As I say, there are changes to make that available to others, which will deal with some issues around data sharing, which I know have caused issues over the last couple of years, but not a, an extension of legitimate interests to public authorities as a, a general principle. Um, when do we expect the UK changes to GDPR actually to be rolled out? I think you, you mentioned the timetable for when the bill might appear. Do we have any kind of sense what the government is saying? Yeah, so I mean, there's a number of bits in the consultation response where the government has said it's considering further. I mentioned in particular um, the rules on uh, DSARs and, and what can be done to, to help certain um, sectors and SMEs. So that to me suggests there's a bit of work to be done on the bill. Um, we are now at the end of June. Um, I certainly don't expect a draft bill before um, the uh, summer recess in Parliament. Um, I think realistic probably we're looking, I would guess, probably September time would be my, my guess. Um, but uh, I think we'll be a few months away from that. And then into, the big question I think is in terms of how quickly this comes into force. Obviously it's got to go through Parliament, which will take um, several months. Um, there will be transitional arrangements around a lot of this as to when it comes into effect. Um, so, you know, the timing, it could be, could well be a, a year or so in terms of how long you know, we have to wait for some of this, but there may be some stuff that comes comes in or organisations can, can benefit from sooner rather than later. Thank you. Um, have we got any answers on the, the polling? We do. We have had a 53%, 54% response. It keeps changing when I look at it. So thank you very much um, for 
for doing that is really really helpful for us to see and um, we will try and digest the results and um uh share share some information with that it's it's um it's really really interesting for us we we have our views on this but it's really interesting to hear what um clients and other organizations are are thinking as to how this will impact on on them yeah i mean i think data protection reform is going to be something that we will pick up again definitely in our next scheduled session towards the end of this year um, hopefully by that point we have a bill we have an understanding as to what the, the shape of these reforms are going to look like and we'll also get um we'll get it um uh, a clearer idea on things I, um, what i do hope though and just to to basically pick up on the point that martin made we are really keen to do a detailed session on international transfers it is a big issue a uh, big issue for a lot of clients but um, we are in the hands of the ic host when that guidance comes out as soon as it does and we've had a chance to digest it we will um we will let you know when we're planning to do another session and we'll focus it solely on international transfers. So um, at that point, we'll have a much, much clearer idea of what how, how the regimes look like and how they compare and contrast. And we can start taking some, you know, we can start giving some thoughts on, on how that works. So that will definitely be the next session, I hope, unless the ICO still hasn't actually published anything in six months time, uh, at which point I think there will be big questions to be to be answered uh, but that i think we'll have the shape of that hopefully a uh, very soon and we will do a subsequent session on that um apart from that i'm conscious that we are now slightly overrunning on time so um uh, i think we will close it down there um please do complete the questions um i think there is there is also a questionnaire uh to be completed as well if you've any comments or thoughts things that you would like us to cover um we do we do value the feedback it helps make these things what they are so um from me uh and the rest of the team thank you all very much <laughs>